This week's video is going to be a bit different. I thought to myself, hey, let's make a video where I show some of the stuff I wrote more than 30 years ago in basic. It's going to be a lot of fun looking at that code and the frankly really bad software design. And what do you think? Can we still run those ancient programs on modern machines? Let's find out. First, a bit of backstory. I was just a kid, about 10 years old, when I started programming in the late 80s. My very first computer was a Commodore 16 that my parents bought me. It used BASIC as the main language and I was mesmerized by it. The idea that you could type something and the computer would just do it, I thought that was so cool. You could load programs into it using a cassette recorder, the Dataset 1530. I also had a few books that contained printed listings of basic programs. In order to run those, you had to manually type over the code. I think three out of four times the programs didn't even work. Either I made a mistake while typing over the code, or there was already a mistake in the code from the book. I think they did that on purpose. It's kind of a miracle actually that I still became a computer scientist after that ordeal. So about a year after I got the Commodore, I spilled a glass of milk over it and the computer was dead. My parents were really mad at me, but eventually they got me another computer, an IBM PCXT machine with MS-DOS on it. I started becoming more serious with programming in BASIC on this machine. Since it couldn't do graphics all that well, I created things like text-based adventures and other text-based games. I'll show you an example in a bit. My third computer was a 286 with EGA Color Graphics and that got me really interested in games with graphics. One of those games actually got published, but it didn't really go according to plan. I'll tell you more about that later. So I dug up three games I made in those days. I found the 16-bit executable files for each of these games and for two of them I still have the source code. Can we run these 30 year old programs written in BASIC on a modern machine? I wasn't completely sure. So I did make a backup video of me eating a banana. You know, just in case. If you just click on a 16-bit executable file on Windows 10, it doesn't work. After looking around and googling a bit, I found that if you want to run 16-bit programs in Windows, you need to enable the MTVDM feature. Unfortunately, that didn't work either, because that feature was removed when Windows changed to 64-bit. So what to do next? Well, you could use a virtual machine. So I installed VirtualBox from Oracle, which is a free software that runs virtual machines. After installing VirtualBox, I created a new virtual Windows XP machine. Then you need to install Windows XP somehow. But where do you get a Windows XP installer nowadays? Well, the Internet Archive, of course. And the version that's on Internet Archive is actually a legit version, including a license code that's condoned by Microsoft. And once you install that on your virtual machine, you're ready to go and you can run 16-bit MS-DOS program inside your Windows XP emulation. Ah, the lovely sound of Windows XP. So I already copied the files over of my original games to the Windows machine. And let me just start with the first one which is this game, it's a text-based game. And this one is called Medieval Adventure. Now the reason that this takes some time to start up is not because I'm doing lots of complicated stuff, it's actually because it's now playing a sound that you can't hear. The problem with writing programs in BASIC is that there is no threads or separate event loops or things like that. So if you want to play a sound, then the command is you play the sound and you wait until it's finished. So that's what is actually happening right now. So this game is a room-based game and I'm controlling this character using the numerical keyboard. I have no idea why I called this medieval adventure. It, it must be because of this very medieval computer card. I have absolutely no idea what I was thinking. Anyway, let's uh, take a look around. So I think when I go here, yeah, so I can go to this room and then I go to the next one and then, ah, I'm dead. That's that's water, just in case you didn't uh, recognize it as such. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go a different direction because obviously that's a bad idea to go there. So I think I go up here, I go here. Let's see, where am I now? Um, okay, uh, can I go here? Ah, yeah. All right, third time's a charm, right?
I guess some of these rooms I should go into, but if I remember correctly. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, so here I have this treasure that I can collect. Up, and now I, I scored 100 points, yes. So let's see, what, what else is there? This is where we have the medieval computer card and I'm just going to collect that and I think that if I now go back to the first room where I started the game, uh, oh, what, what was it again? Oh, I think I have to go here. Ah, oh, this brings back a lot of memories. All right, and then I go back to the first room and because this is not all there is. Here we actually have a second level, so I can go to this thing and then I go up. Okay, now I have no idea where I have to go. Um, <laughs> okay, let's try. Are you ready? <sighs> okay. Okay, oh, this feels like Russian roulette. Okay, I'm gonna try this one. Ah! Anyway, I'm, I'm going to quit this game now. This is the game Diamond. I made this in uh, 1993, I think. And uh, this, you have this uh, really cool effect of uh, particles or whatever it is. It's, these are actually randomly generated every time you start the game. I spent a lot of time on getting this to work correctly. So this is what the game looks like. It's a, uh, like a chessboard. And uh, what you're gonna see is I create a new game like this. And then uh, this is your uh, level. And the idea is that you have to use the knight move. So you start in the bottom right and you use the knight move to go through the board. Let's uh, make a move like this, for example. So you see, when you go onto one of those diamonds, it becomes this box. And the, the interesting thing is you can't go back to this field anymore. So for example, if I go like this and then I go back to that one, then game over. So let's try that again. So the idea is then that you go over all these diamonds and you have to uh, get all of them obviously when you have all the diamonds then your level is completed so let's complete this level there that's the first level and now we're going to the second level and you see this is already a bit more complicated because the, the more diamonds there are in the level the harder the level is and you also see here on the right, I, it, it may look like this is actually a design choice to show the diamond and the box here, but it's not. It's actually, I'm using those areas of the screen to copy them when I, whenever I start a new level and I copy them over to the left side. So I actually need those things uh, in order to draw them. This is the code of the game. Obviously it's a single file. And what you have to realize is that there is no supporting library or whatever or that's gonna help you out with anything you just enter commands and the computer runs commands and then you wait until the command is finished and then you do something else so something like a game loop doesn't exist events doesn't exist you read from memory and you write to memory if you look at this first line for example I, I really love this is you see the poke and peek those are actually commands that look at a particular memory address, that's peak, and 1047 is actually the memory address for the numlock status in, of the keyboard. So what happens here is that I'm, uh, I'm looking at the numlock status because I need numlock to be on because that's how the game responds to the, uh, the input. But then I do poke 1047, which basically sets, forces the numlock state to be on. And then the way that the application is structured is that actually there's lots of these go-to statements that redirect you to different areas of the program. So here, apparently, if there is some kind of error, I don't know what kind of error, maybe there is no keyboard or whatever, then you go to 2710. And what is at 2710? Let's see, we're gonna scroll down. And at 2710 we have, ah, we have the error messages. So if we go down a bit, we see that here I'm, I'm, I'm drawing some things. So I think this is the intro screen. And then this is the manual. So it's all hard coded here. This is actually for loading a game from a file. I have no idea why I added that. It's completely useless. Anyway, so here we have um, 
an interesting way of loading data uh, using a bunch of if statements. I mean, this could probably be done a bit easier, but this loads the level. And then depending on the sequence of keys that I pressed, so that's actually the night move keys, I changed the position of the box selector in the screen. So what you also see is that I didn't make any distinction between what is shown on the screen and the game state. If you create games nowadays, those two things would be completely different. That you have the game world, which has an internal representation, and then you have the rendering loop that actually displays it onto the screen. So here, it's the same thing. So that also means if I want to detect whether you're at a diamond, I'm actually looking at the pixel color on the screen. And if that is a particular color, then I play a sound and then I know, oh, hey, this is, uh, this is a diamond, so I should give uh, some points and I should replace it with a box. We have a game over screen here and let's see what else do we have here. And then it's the end of the game uh, where I'm playing a longer MIDI sequence. Uh, I'm I'm displaying some text like, uh, yes, you won, do you want to play it again, etc., etc. Then uh, if you scroll down, you see that we have the data. So I also added some comments to my code. For example, if you translate this to English, it says data, data, really useful. I'm, I'm actually pretty impressed that I actually separated the data from the, from the application code. So that's not so bad. Now, of course, this was a hugely successful game, not. So I decided why not make a second version. So I made Diamond 2. Uh, I think I was a bit fed up with this uh, random dot drawing in the, in the first version. So I just removed that and I just made it two colors like this. And what I also did is I added a few extra moves and extra things to make it a bit more exciting. Like uh, I'll show you. So uh, this is an, a new game. So actually the, the shape of the board can be different. So that's a really nice extra feature. And you see you have these red mega diamonds, which are 50 points instead of 10 points. One thing I changed here is that I now have a, a kind of a cursor which I can move around to so that I know where I am. Because I noticed in the first version of the game I just had to enter these sequences of key presses. And then at some point you make a mistake and you don't know where you are in the sequence so it's really annoying. But here you can just move this thing around and then I press enter to actually select this diamond and it becomes a box. Slightly improved graphics, lovely. And I added another extra feature, which is that next to these night moves, you could also do other things like something I call triple shot, which I think you can move three blocks to the left, to the right or up or down, uh, something like that. Then there is a random move where you can go anywhere in the, in the level. And there is a, a one move, which just moves you one to the left or to the right or up or down. So more possibilities, but there is a maximum to each of these moves that you can make. Uh, and these are actually over the entire game. So you have like uh, 10 or 20 levels, uh, but you have a limited number of these things you can use throughout the entire game. So these are not numbers that reset every level. So I added some comments here to explain what were the, the extra new features in, inside this game. Using my poke and peek again here to set the numlock uh, key, uh, doing lots of painting. It's basically set up in more or less the same way. Also, you see that at the, at the end of the game, there's again the data. This is still here. I did not improve that part. I maybe should have done that. And this is a save game. Apparently, I still thought saving games was useful. Uh, you can actually switch on and off the sound in this particular version of Diamond, so that's, uh, that's nice. Uh, and then we have quitting the game. The second game actually got published in Kijk, which is a popular Dutch scientific magazine for kids. They had this section in the magazine about programming. It had listings of basic code that readers sent in, small, fun programs that did something interesting. They also published hobbyist software on a five and a quarter inch floppy disk the Run Flagazine it was called. You would have people write their own spreadsheet programs and stuff like that. So I sent in my Diamond game, the second one, and they actually published it. I was really excited. But when I got a copy of the published version, I noticed they actually fiddled around with my code and reset the extra moves, like the random move at each level. And as a result, the game was trivially easy to finish. I was so disappointed. You know, the main reason I became a computer scientist is because I encountered this stuff already as a kid and I got passionate about it. If you have children yourself 
and they're into this stuff. Let them discover their passion and support it as much as you can. It's gonna have a big impact on their lives. And who knows, they might become a really good software engineer when they grow up. Or they're just gonna make a fool out of themselves on YouTube. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this, even though it's a bit different than what you're used to from me. Thanks for watching, take care. And see you in the next video.